Now, the next format, as you know, in, in the program, there's different formats. Um, uh, we have these debates uh, on the main stage, but we also have a format which is called Inspire. And this is, maybe you know the format of TED Talks, for instance. So it's a thought, short, which is presented to you uh, in max 15 minutes, and then you will have the chance to interact uh, in the next 10 minutes. And for that, we have our speaker, thank you, <laughs> ciao. <laughs> our first speaker, who is Louis Klein. Uh, he is the Dean of the European Democracy Lab here in Germany and an expert on systemic change and complexity. Uh, he will give a talk on the topic of mind politics, civil society won't do. Louis. It won't do it. Um, oh, after use the clicker. Here, here we are. Hello and good afternoon. Uh, pleasure to have you all in here. Um, for the next half an hour, um, I'm asked to inspire you. Uh, and I've chosen the most provocative thing I could come up with, which is to say civil society won't do it, which is probably uh, a dangerous thing to, to say it in here, in this room and in this conference. My name is Louis Klein. That sounds a little bit like a luxury handbag or like a, like a winery at the Moselle. Uh, the letter is actually where I come from. I'm the dean of the European School of Governance and, well, it says so, so nicely, an economist and social scientist by trade. I start with a quote of um, one of the founders of the critical school, Theodore W. Adorno, who said, there's no right life in the wrong one. And we've learned a lot this morning of um, and about the exploitation game. And this is where I want to come up with an invitation to rethink system change out of what we've seen in the last years, uh, revisit a few old ideas, a few new ideas, and come up with an approach that may uh, open up new possibilities and opportunities to move ahead. I've chosen this uh, rather uh, funny image of the <coughs> Avengers to describe what we see in terms of folklore in civil society when it goes, uh, when we go on about changing the world, or making the world a better place. We found in by Hollywood that changing the world is a matter of a few dedicated um, men and women. They save the world in the course of the afternoon, and, uh, and in the evening they chill with pizza and beer. And this is my first critique, that we are operating our ideas about change on two shortcomings in the reception of the Enlightenment. The first one is our naive idea about self-organization. The invisible hand is not our friend, so we better watch it. It's a metaphor for self-organization. I would say self-organization is a wonderful thing in free markets and democracy. Yes, but cancer is as well an emergent process of self-organization, and we do not particularly fancy it. So there's a dark side to self-organization, which should remind us that we should be aware of those processes and safeguard them. Safeguard them in a way that we do not slide to the dark side of markets or democracy. I come to that later. The second thing that spins around our notion of changing the world in civil society is another shortcoming of the Enlightenment, the emancipation of the individual. Yes, mind the individual. Mind the individual power and respect people. However, what we see today is an oscillation between hybrids and burnout, especially in civil society. Yes, 
with great power comes great responsibility on the one side. But mind what your powers are really. And they are probably not that mighty than we think. Because if we think that we can save the world in the course of the afternoon, we will be disappointed, frustrated. We may want to walk the extra mile, and the other extra mile, and another extra mile, unless we burnt out. We've seen that as one of the topics of a conference, that burnout is a serious issue in civil society, in all these NGOs trying to save the world. I'm Dean of the European School of Governance. And that first sounds like um, a university or an institution where politicians are trained. That's not the case. The European School of Governance is, first of all, a school of thought. And European stands for the, <clears throat> the inescapability of diversity. If we look at Europe, we are diverse. And if thriving on diversity has to prove right, it will be in Europe. If we master our diversity and bring that towards a good cause, um, we are one step ahead and closer to what I'd like to call a successful idea of governing the Anthropocene. In the 21st century, mankind, humankind, is so collectively so powerful that the future of the planet, the future of Earth, depends on humankind's ability to civilize, cultivate and govern itself. So governance is a question that reaches far beyond uh, what we've been debating so far, national parliaments and participation of um, people in a specific country. That's the challenge of the 21st century. Um, I put here um, an image which links to um, European New School Thinking 2019, which is a blog post at uh, the website of the European School of Governance. So if you want to um, dig deeper into what I'm presenting here, you're most welcome to do so. We put the 2019 as a reference to two schools we'd, l we'd like to follow. One is the new school in New York, which was founded in 1919, progressive, liberal, um, and filled with the idea that intellectuals and scientists shall engage in public discourse. And the second root is the German Bauhaus, founded in 1919. Again, both will celebrate their 100th birthday next year. And this, again, was a school experimental in thought and looking into engaging in the development of society. And we'd like to live up to that tradition. I stand here in front of you uh, because of an article I wrote in the German philosophical business magazine, Agora 42, uh, on, um, well, the fallacy of social entrepreneurship and the question, will social entrepreneurship save us, will save the earth, will save society? No, it will not. Mind politics. And what, what does that say? That says we have to distinguish two realms, a private realm and a public realm. And everything that we are looking at in terms of civil society or economy happens in the private world. A world that is based on merit, a world that is based on positive sanction, you do something and you are rewarded for your performance. And, and that's the major thing to be aware of, it's based on exclusion. Privacy is privacy because you can exclude people to enter your privacy. 
a private organization can hire people and can lay off people. That's a totally different rationale, a totally different logic to the public realm. The public realm is all of us. It's the debate on what are the ground rules by which we want to get along and live together. We, can't, we cannot exclude anybody from the public realm. That's a different logic, a different rationale. The law applies upon everybody. We cannot sack citizens. We cannot, well, we, we see that in, in, in North America at the moment. Well, yes, you can sack a few um, illegal immigrants. That will be the first stage. But what will you do with the underperforming members of society if the rationale of um, the leading party is, oh, we do it like in business. How do you sack citizens? That's a question that is open, but the rationale is leading there. The public realm is silent. It is based on rules, and if rules are not respected, there is a sanction, a negative sanction. But if we all live by good rules, there will be no sanction. It will be silent. Good politics is invisible because the rules of society that which we gave to ourselves will be a tram line, be a corridor, which in we can exercise our individual freedom without getting in conflict with the law. And that's certainly, in contrast, a paradox if we look at how we celebrate politics at the moment. Politics try to be visible, but if they were good, they were not visible. A paradox. We have to rethink here what we are actually striving for. Governing the serious games of society. It's another blog post. You can find that on, on the website of the European School of Governance. But I'd like to start with a story. 6th of, Ju of July 2006 was the 60th birthday of my father. My son and my two nephews were playing in the sandbox. And a friend of my father, a management consultant from Hamburg, was overlooking the scene, slightly puzzled, and finally asked, what are you doing there? Are you, are you building a sandcastle at night and, and, and uh, I don't see walls? What is it that you do? And the youngest nephew replied, equally puzzled, Hang on, wait, we built kindergarten here because we have the factories over there and the airport um, <clears throat> on, on that side. And if we don't build kindergartens, the people won't be happy. What they've done They've taken SimCity, that which they played on the computer, into the sandbox. That is their perspective on society, that they have to look for balance between, between economic needs, between the needs of the people, education, science, you name it. It comes natural to them. This generation, the millennials, they understand the idea of gamification completely to different to what we look at if we say gamification. We think, oh, we do something flow and the people will be highly motivated. No, what they do is they look at society as one big computer game in which the complexity of the, the various elements have to be balanced. How wonderful is that? Learning democracy. We heard a lot about that today, and there's only one aspect I'd like to share with you in that invitation to rethink, rethink uh, system change. Goes back to Polybius. He had been a historian from Greece, living in Rome, lived fairly 200 years before common age. And he said, in his theory of regimes, we, we, we know the one ruler, or the few, 
or all of us. We call it monarchy, aristocracy, or democracy. But there's a dark side to it. There's tyranny, there's oligarchy, and the sixth term that we've all together have forgotten about, there's holocracy, which is to say there's a dark side of democracy. And the dark side we enter if we replace the focus on the common good or the common wealth by self-interest. A king, a self-interested king, becomes a tyrant. A self-interested aristocracy become oligarchs. And a self-interested democracy will become an oligarchy, a tyranny of the majority. We've forgotten about that. We apply the naive idea of self-organization. Like, oh, if we do our, do our participation and um, ask the people what they want, we will come up with a good solution. Mind the question. The question is, is not, what do you want for yourself? The question is, what do we want for all of us? That's the question of democracy. We are not looking at a political form that is like consumerism. Oh, I, I, I wish something for myself and I want politicians to deliver it. That's not democracy. I need to be brief. So I jump on to the next chapter, the next invitation, that is about change. I said it's an invitation to rethink system change, systemic change. There are three things I'd like you to take away from today's talk. First of all, system change, it's all about systemicity, but there are th three points we need to take care of. First is emergence. Aristotle said, the whole is something different. Sometimes we say more, but different is what he, uh, he can be quoted rightfully for. Then the sum of its parts. So there's more to a society than a collective of individuals. Second, contextivity. There's no right life in the wrong one. We've been there before. The logic of the context is always stronger than the logic of the intentions. You heard about that earlier today with the hotel game, that even if you change rules within, the overruling, the, the overruling part is the ground rules of the game. If you don't change the ground rules of the game, if you don't change the context, it will reproduce the same results over and over again. Albert Einstein said that is insanity, to try the same thing over and over again and expecting different outcomes. And the last thing to take away concerning change is this one. I call it the butterfly effect. 21. We all know about the butterfly effect, which is to say we have a butterfly somewhere in the Amazonas, and will that, that will cause um, a to tornado somewhere else in the world. We know everything is interconnected. But with this image here, I'd like to draw your attention towards the, pic the picture puzzle effect of it. You see a butterfly, but then you see two faces talking to each other. It's the same image, it's the same lines, it's the same color, but two different meanings. And if we look at change, we may look for a butterfly effect, a small thing that changes the entire, entire system. But we can be as adventurous as to re evaluate, reassess, what is it that we actually see? Is what we see before our eyes really that dark and gloomy? Or do we have already everything in place that we need 
to change the course of our society to a better future. It may be that, that we are much closer to a good solution than we actually think without the tedious uh, work of civil society. I promise you I come back to governing the serious games of society. And that reconnects to what we've heard earlier about the exploitation game. Here in Germany, every year, the game of the year is awarded. And the game of the year is a game where all the players stay in the game from the beginning to the end. And a game that is unfolding in a way that every player has the rightful expectation to come out as the winner of the game. And in the end, the winner wins by a margin, not a humiliating defeat. The settlers of Catan were such a game of the year in 1995 and have been very popular ever since. In contrast, we learned about the hotel game, or we all know Monopoly. Pretty early in the, in, the, in the course of the game, it becomes clear those who have the expensive streets will win in the end, and the rest is agony, and one player after the other will be bankrupt, and in the end, only one person has all the money. Why is it that we modeled our economic order like Monopoly and not like Settlers of Catan? If we say, let's build better games that has implications for our futures, for the work of the futures, it will be game designers or insight and knowledge in game design. What's a good, what's a good game? What's a good game for the players? What's a good game, or what, what's a good game in terms of the result it, it produces for society? And how can we build it? How can we referee it? How can we govern it? I've been on a journey to Vietnam, and there in Hanoi, I visited the Temple of Literacy. And that's pretty much the image that you see on the side. The highest esteem in society were with those in charge of the games that run society. And that may be the future of work. It will not be the founders, it will not be the investment bankers or those in the hedge funds with the highest esteem, those who make the most money. It may be the managers and civil servants of the future who design games, livable and thrivable games for society. An economic order, a political order, the order in education, science, arts, that allows all of us to exercise our individual freedom, knowing that this will contribute to a better future. And I will end on that note, another image. The Republic, democracy, it's a very old thing, and it's still around, and probably our, f our future reconnects to our past. And only because it was so uh, intriguing to me to, to uh, object what we had here on the panel earlier about the young generation that is not um, interested in politics. Remember the, the three boys from the sandbox in 2006? My son is now chairman of the conservative student organization in Rheinland-Pfalz, Rheinland-Palatinum, and in that role, member of the board of the CDU in Rheinland-Pfalz. Second, my, my eldest nephew is studying informatics, and the third one was sworn in two, two weeks ago for a career as detective for the German po police. These young men are stepping up to shoulder responsibility. Probably 
a good future is much closer than we think. And change, change may, our ideas of change may be rethought that we come up with new ideas to prepare successfully for governing the Anthropocene. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Louis. Um, it was very good to hear your thoughts also after the discussion we've had before on, on the future councils, and, and it was very complimentary. Thank you so much. Uh, we have around four and a half minutes for discussion, um, so if somebody has a short point to make, short question, who wants to engage? Yes, please. Back might seem like a philosophical seminar issue. It is not meant like that. I quoted Adorno a couple of years back, uh, as you did. There is no good life in the wrong one, right? I reread this, this uh, Minima Moralia part uh, recently, and it sounds much more complex to me. It is much more dialectical. It's not only, it's, it's like paradoxical. You have to live, on the other hand, you have to live as if there is the good life coming only from your own choice. This is a Kantian position. And I would argue for this. I would argue where else should the good life or the context come from than from individual or group actions in the wrong life? Where else should it come from? And this comes back to your point that civil society won't make it. I really haven't, you haven't fully convinced me mm. that civil society won't do it because uh, there was not enough sufficient argument that, that, that civil society could contribute to something to the context, right? I haven't seen the argument fully fledged, if you like. Yeah. Maybe. Sure. yeah oh, okay. I stand here. Yeah. Uh, Just because of the live stream, you know. Oh, yes. I, can, I could <laughs> wave to the audience, which I happily do. Um, I'm, I'm fully with you. I had half an hour. And we could go f further into systems and cybernetics on the one side or the phil phil philosophical discourse on the other side. Um, it's not so much a critique of civil society as an element of society, where, where in a pre-political debate, discourse, arguments, new ideas surface. But if you want to implement good ideas, you need to walk the way of politics. The politics are legit legitimate to come up with rules, regulations, which apply to everybody. Civil society has not, is not entitled to do that. So it's rather a working hand in hand than to say, oh, we, don't, we had that earlier here, and it, it, the, the impression um, emerged that we don't trust politicians, we don't trust the media, and therefore we need to do it all amongst ourselves in, in civil society. And uh, asked about my core cool value last night at the, at the speaker's uh, dinner, I said my core cool value in this year is reconciliation, to have a meaningful handshake between civil society and politics and to learn that in a democracy, and, th and that's the beauty of it, the state and politics, this is us. And we certainly want to see different procedures in place, different rules in place, how we play that game, politics, how we play that game, uh, discourse and coming to agreement within a society, contra to what we see at the moment. There's a lot of room for improvement, and this is where my argument goes to. It's not that to say there's no, there's no inclusion of civil society when it comes to politics, not at all. But civil society alone, on its own, playing by rules of the market, like in social entrepreneurship, will not provide solutions to entire societies and the public realm we can live by. 
Thank you so much. Unfortunately, we have to close this uh, discussion, but thank you, Louis. And we also have a small present for you. It's a German book. Yes. <laughs> a present. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Now we have uh, Hanno on stage uh, for... Uh, yeah, so take two minutes, relax, breathe, and then we'll gather again. Thank you.